the traitor king, Edward VIII. King Edward VIII was born on the 23rd of June, 1894, as Edward Albert Christian George Andrew Patrick David, but his family referred to him as David. His father was King George V, who was the grandson of the mighty Queen Victoria, and his mother was Mary of Teck, daughter of the Duke of Teck. Edward and his siblings were raised by nannies rather than his parents, which was common for the time for the upper class but would leave an impact on young Edward. He would recall in his early years being lonely and longing for love. He mentioned his childhood as being a reason why he did not have children and did not want to have children. Edward did have a good reason to feel this way. After years of serving the royal family as a nanny, the nanny was let go once evidence of child abuse had came about. He's noted as having a relaxed and attractive nature about himself and had many friends. As a teen, he enrolled into the Royal Naval College in Osborne, then transferred to the Dartmouth Naval College two years later, followed by him joining the Navy two years after that. On the 16th of May, Edward became Duke of Cornwall and Duke of Rosse once his father ascended the throne as King George V. A month later, he was titled Prince of Wales and had the ceremony in Wales where he recited a few words in Welsh for the audience. As World War I broke out, Edward found that he was old enough to enlist and very eager to see action. However, the Secretary of State for War, Lord Kitchener, refused to allow him on the field due to the risk of himself and his fellow soldiers. He did see the front lines though. Edward would visit the sick and injured soldiers and inspect the royal troops in the name of the king. Seeing their king's heir in the trenches with them was just what they needed to help boost their morale and it gave Edward notoriety back home in Britain and the Military Cross in 1916 for his war efforts. Edward's younger brother John passed away at age 13 in the year 1919 due to his epileptic seizures. Edward was 11 years older than his brother, so they didn't have the same bond as he did with the second oldest son, Bertie. Little Johnny's death would, however, show the true nature of Edward through his open and honest comments about his brother's passing. A letter to his mistress read that Little Johnny's death was nothing more than an inconvenient nuisance. He went on to complain how Johnny was sickly and a person he only saw on the holidays. Then for some sick reason, Edward decided to write his mother something just as grimy in a letter to which Edward felt guilt and had to write a letter of apology back to her after she didn't respond to the initial nasty letter. The 20s would be Edward's peak. As Prince of Wales, he would represent his father King George V at ceremonies domestic and abroad. He enjoyed a great rank, traveled abroad, ladies found him to be an attractive bachelor and even somewhat of a fashion icon after visiting the United States in 1924. Edward journeyed a trip around South America with his brother Bertie, then to Australia where he met the local indigenous population, the Aborigines. Another important flaw with Edward would be his skewed view on race. Although racial superiority was thought to be scientifically proven back then, Edward was unfortunately particularly expressive about these views, such as mentioning how the Aborigines look like disgusting creatures that look more monkey than man. Edward unfortunately held these views on race for the rest of his life. A major requirement of monarchy is to secure the line of succession by having legitimate children. So a royal match was made for Edward. Princess Victoria Louise of Prussia was chosen for him due to her potential in strengthening alliances, but nothing came from this relationship. Edward did meet a woman in France back in 1917 named Marguerite Alibert, but after a year, the relationship was called off abruptly, and shortly after, Alibert was on trial for the murder of her husband. She was acquitted on the charge, but the government and the royal family had to make sure that Edward's name was not associated with this trial at all. Edward's womanizing ways throughout the 20s and 30s concerned the government and the royal family, but more particularly the king. King George V is noted as mentioning how he wished that the succession would skip Edward and pass to Edward's younger brother, Albert, then to Albert's daughter, Elizabeth. Edward had a few more affairs with married women, such as Lady Furness, the wife of a British peer. Lady Furness would often be busy with her upper class activities, but she needed to make sure that Edward's eye didn't wander. So she asked her friend Wallace Simpson 
to help entertain the prince while she was away. Lady Furness didn't know this, but the moment Edward met Wallace, she had lost him. Bessie Wallace Warfield was born on June the 19th, 1896. Her father, Tico Warfield, was a prominent flower merchant who was very popular in their town of Baltimore, Maryland, and her mother was Alice Montague, the daughter of stockbroker William Montague. Wallace's father died while she was an infant, so Wallace and her mother had to live off of the charity of her late husband's in-laws. Wallace had a normal academic career as well and grew up to be a fashionable and attractive woman. Her fine violet blue eyes, petite figure, quick wits, vitality, and concentration on herself made her very appealing. As mentioned, Wallace married, then divorced, then married again to Ernest Simpson. Although Ernest was a successful businessman, he along with many others lost so much money during the Great Depression that struck New York City. It's speculated that Wallace was deeply affected by her financial dependence as a child, that when the Depression happened, she refused to accept the truth of her situation. She continued to front as if nothing was the matter, and that the Depression didn't hurt them too bad financially. Between 1931 and 1934, Wallace had been introduced and occasionally socialized around the prince through her friend, Lady Furness. And at this moment, Wallace became the prince's mistress. It seems as though Ernest turned a blind eye to the affair in order to reap the benefits of wealth and status Wallace received. He could have even been an encouraging factor in this plan. There's no doubt that Wallace loved her husband, Ernest, but her fears pushed her towards Edward because he was the security and stability she needed. Ernest still needed to do business in the States, so he would leave for long periods of time, and Edward would insist that Wallace stay while Ernest went back to the States. Edward would deny the relationship with Wallace to the king and the prime minister, yet photographs of the pair surfaced after their intimate vacations where they expressed open PDA with each other. Shortly after, it also became known that Wallace was still married on top of that. This wouldn't be too much of an issue to the common people, especially today, but this was very taboo at the time. It was rare to find a divorced courtier, let alone a future queen being a twice divorcee. In 1935, the first instance of spying on Edward and Wallace begun by the Metropolitan Police, where they found that Wallace was having an affair with Edward and a man named Guy Trundle. This may have been because Wallace deeply missed her husband, Ernest. She would keep in constant contact with him while he was in the U.S. However, Wallace and Edward's scandal didn't have any censorship in the United States. The embarrassment Ernest must have felt having his wife's cheating scandal in international news. He was deeply upset and lonely without his wife, so Wallace set him up with her childhood friend, Mary. Wallace wanted Mary to be there for Ernest so he could have some better quality to his life. However, this went awry when the two grew romantic feelings for each other. On January the 20th, 1936, King George V passed away, and Edward descended the throne as King Edward VIII. The government circle was concerned about their new king. The monarchy isn't what it was in medieval times. He was expected to be a neutral figurehead. Edward had made a few controversial comments as Prince of Wales. He is noted as saying something must be done when referring to a coal strike that was happening at the time. Although Edward never pressed the topic any further, he was deemed to be in favor of the strikers, which was an inappropriate gesture. He also concerningly left confidential government documents lying around. Many were worried Wallace or one of their many party guests could access the documents. Edward also went against tradition with the national coin image of himself. Traditionally, the monarch's image that preceded them would face alternate directions from each other. Edward broke tradition by facing the same way as his father in order to have the part in his hair displayed. Most importantly, while Edward and Wallace were cruising through Europe again, Edward became very transparent about his intentions to marry Wallace. This was very concerning, especially when in November of 1936, Edward told the Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin this news. Baldwin had already committed what could be viewed as treason when he ordered the government to spy on the new king and Wallace. He found that Edward was being essentially cuckolded by Wallace with Guy Trundle. Edward and Wallace had a very unorthodox relationship. She didn't curtsy him, she didn't bow submissively like the rest of the nation. She would rather often display a vexed attitude towards Edward, and this would attract Edward even more. I'm sure at first it was playful, but the line between playful and real became intertwined. Either way, Wallace had the control in the relationship. And the true reason for the entire abdication scandal we are about to discuss 
could be the fear of Wallace running England through Edward. The spying revealed this information in that Wallace was in the process of finalizing her divorce with Ernest. She applied for divorce on the grounds of Ernest committing adultery with her childhood friend Mary. This would save what little reputation Wallace had and give her more legitimacy in her marriage to Edward. This was a very sad and lonely time in Wallace's life. However, she still didn't want to divorce her husband. But he had had enough of the royal drama and Wallace wanted him to be happy, so she proceeded. Her trauma and fear put her in a predicament that was no longer in her control. Edward threatened abdication if he couldn't marry Wallace, and when Wallace thought it'd be best to call off the marriage with Edward, he threatened to kill himself. All Wallace could do was lie in the bed that she had made for herself and take the right of abdication with Edward. Prime Minister Baldwin had a survey done throughout the government and the Commonwealth. He found that it was unanimous that no one was in favor of the king marrying a twice-divorced woman. However, the people were, were divided on the subject of Wallace and Edward. Some adored the fact that love wins, and the other half were horrified that the head of the Church of England would be marrying such a woman. This discourse could have opened up a constitutional discussion about the relations of a monarch. But this wasn't a conversation the royal family nor the court wanted to have. Edward had a few options. Be king with no Wallace. Be king with Wallace not having the title of queen consort. Or abdicate. The latter option being the more favorable option for everyone. Edward found it impossible to rule without the woman he loved by his side. So he was in favor of abdication as well. Famously, Winston Churchill encouraged Edward to fight for his rights as king. But Edward didn't want to deal with the inconvenience of it all. On the 10th of October, he signed the abdication papers, and the next night he addressed the nation with this speech. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. And now that I have been succeeded by my brother, the Duke of... My first words must be to declare my allegiance to him. This I do with all my heart. You all know the reasons which have, have impelled me to renounce the throne. But I want you to understand that in making up my mind, I did not forget the country or the empire, which as Prince of Wales, and lately as king, I have for 25 years tried to serve. Edward left Britain for Austria. Then, a few months later, he reunited with Wallace. Edward was now appointed Duke of Windsor by the new king, his brother, King George VI. Now that Edward was with the woman he loved, the couple became minor celebrities. You'd think as the Duke of Windsor, Edward and Wallace would still hold a royal title but only Edward did. This is a petty issue that Edward would constantly bring up to the royal family for decades. Albert, or Bertie, as his family called him, ascended the throne due to his brother's actions. When Albert found out about Edward's abdication, he seeked consolement in his mother and cried his eyes out, thinking about the burden of the crown he and his daughter, Elizabeth, would have to burden for the rest of their lives. However, all happens for a reason, and little did Albert know that his daughter Elizabeth would go on to be the monarch that rivaled her namesake, Queen Elizabeth I, by defining nearly a century of the common era. 